Okay, Holly, you're good to go. Okay, good morning. And uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. It is 9-17, um, Tuesday, June 6th. Stephanie, can you please take attendance? Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ava Bermuda Zimmerman. Ava has not joined us yet. Britt Marie Cole Johnson. Marie has not joined us. Uh, Ellen McKitterick. Ellen McKitterick. Stephanie, you're you're going in and out. We can't hear you. Hello. So, I, are you back? Yes. We didn't hear you me? after you named it. Yeah, now I can. Okay, I so Eva and Britt Marie. Okay, so Ellen McKitterick. Present. There we go. Mike Soltis. Present. And Holly Williams. Present. All right, we have a quorum. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. I'd like to uh, welcome and thank the members of the public for joining us this morning. Uh, the first item, um, I'd like to ask the committee to review the April 4, 2023 meeting minutes and um, invite a motion to approve those minutes. May I, moved. I have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Aaron, would you please lead the discussion on the CEO delegation of authority? Well, thank you so Just making sure I wasn't on mute. Thank you so much. So this, we don't have a, oh, and, and I see that Ava's here. Um, terrific. So this is a discussion. We don't have a resolution drafted yet because we wanted your input on what the draft should look like. The question is just in the event of the CEO's absence or incapacity, who should have authority to um, basically sign checks, keep things running. Um, the bylaws provide that the board may by resolution delegate one, some other person or persons, some or all of the CEO's duties and may appoint one or more persons to serve as an acting CEO in the event of an absence or incapacity of the CEO. So this is what we did uh, last year when Andrea had her knee surgery. Um, it was a planned event and so the board had time to do a resolution. Bylaws also say that the board may by resolution authorize the CEO to delegate signature authority to employees of the authority. Um, if there were a situation where there was a planned absence, we could have, I think it makes sense to have the board identify a specific CEO for that period of time. The concern I have is if there's not a planned absence, if there's an unexpected absence, um, or, you know, even if it's just, the, the standard has been, um, you know, if you're going to be under anesthesia, like in traditional state agencies, if you're, if a commissioner's under anesthesia, they usually would have um, a delegation of authority for that day or week or whatever it is that they're going to be out to their deputy commissioner or some other specified person. So, you know, it's only a day or two. Does it really need a whole board resolution? Or if there's an unexpected absence. Um, we have two options. Well, we have three options for that. One, which is basically status quo, which is the chairperson of the board does kind of have authority that was given in the very beginning of stages. We could clarify that resolution um, to say sort of in the CEO's absence or incapacity, the chairperson um, of the board has the authority, signatory authority until such time as the CEO returns or the board appoints a acting CEO. Second option is adopting a 
specific resolution authorizing the CEO to delegate authority to a manager at the authority um, in the event of a absence or incapacity of no longer than whatever specified time, I would say up to two or three weeks with notice to the board to handle those sort of unexpected absences or colonoscopies or the like where you're gonna be under anesthesia, but it's not for long and it's not serious. The third option would be a formal resolution specifying a particular individual to serve as the acting CEO in the event the CEO um, is absent or incapacitated. I think one options one or two would work. I don't think option three works incredibly well because having the kind of standing resolution um, assumes that that designated person will not also be absent or incapacitated in the event of the CEO's absence. So it's, it is, is what they do when they have the computers. Um, but even then, I, I know of situations at DAS over my tenure there where you could have both the commissioner and the deputy out, and you still need to find it, you still need to have the authority to designate somebody else. Um, so that's why I would recommend either one or two, but we really wanted to have your input and, and thoughts before we develop a resolution to bring to the board next month. Okay, thank you. Any um, questions? About options one or two to be the most viable options. Well, Sherry, my thought, which is, if it's going to be a, for a shorter period of time. Pick a day, a, a week, two weeks. I would have the uh, CEO name someone. If it's going to be a longer period of time, my inclination would be to have um, to get the board involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's a short period of time, I don't know how much process we need for continuity. Yeah, I think. I mean. There are certain, depending on the time of year and um, month or quarter, there are, you know, I authorize the payments to AFLAC. Those are pretty high. You know, I have to authorize um, some of the other large payments, which are higher than our existing delegation to the comptroller and financial staff. So... You know, those are the, like the day-to-day -day things that I think it's helpful to have that that delegation authority just to hold, keep things running until the board can act so that we can make sure we're paying our bills on time really is is, is really what I'm I'm thinking. It, it's not, um, I don't think it's good practice to have sort of a, a long-term substitute without board action. Mm -hmm. um, the one downside in, to option two is that if I know I'm going to be out, then it's easy enough to identify a substitute. If I get hit by a bus, then kind mm -hmm. of back to not having a designated substitute. And so perhaps it's not one or two, perhaps it's one and two, you know, clarified by resolution that the chairperson kind of can act in the absence of CEO action, CEO can act for, you know, absences of up to, as I said, maybe 10 days um, or a week with notice to the board so that you know when I'm gonna be out. And again, with modern technology, if, if, if I take a day to go to the beach, I, I can, can still do everything. But if, mm -hmm. um, you know, by some currently unforeseen set of right. circumstances, my husband surprises me with a cruise to, you know, or I'm not going to have IT access. You know, we'd want to have somebody being able to pay the bills. Um, mm. So I don't know. I just, that's really why we wanted to uh, get your thoughts. So that hybrid idea sounds <clears throat> um, 
interesting, which is if it's something planned for a short period of time, the CEO can delegate. But if it's unplanned, with the absence of a CEO delegation or an extended period of time, that's when you'd have board involvement. Is that I mean, I think we the status quo is that for an absence of a of an extended period of time, we absolutely have board involvement. This is really just who authorizes the payment of bills until the board can act. So I think the hybrid would be um, giving that authority to the chairperson of the board until such time as the board can act. You know, just knowing that it can take a few days to kind of pull together a board for board meeting for a quorum. Okay, well that sounds right. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay. What we can do and, and basically this is um kind of, of along the um, model of, of section 4-8 of the Connecticut General Statutes, which is how commissioners handle these things. Um, so what we can do, not for Thursday, because we have a full agenda already, but for July, we will draft a resolution that um, kind of uses both one and two. So authorizing the CEO to delegate a th contracting or not contracting signatory authority to a manager in the in the event of a mm -hmm. planned absence or incapacity of um, you know a week or so um, auth clarifying and sort of reiterating that the chairperson of the board has signatory authority um, kind of in the sort of in the absence of anybody else, the, the chairperson has mm -hmm. that authority um, and sort of reiterating that if any extended absence, we would expect board action. Right. Okay, thank you. We'll okay. Put it together. All right, shall we move on to the next agenda item? Uh, mm -hmm. Michael, would you? Please lead the discussion on potential revisions to the private plan policy. Absolutely, thank you, Mike. And good morning, everybody. Um, so the committee may remember a few months ago at the beginning of the year, we had um, done a review of our consolidated policy documents, um, essentially because they were written in 2021 before the program had fully launched and we had to be on the benefits portion and we wanted to make sure they were you know, up to date and no longer, you know just based on the theory of what we thought was going to happen, but on the reality of what was happening with the program. We plan on doing a similar uh, process for our private plan policies and procedures that were also, you know, written back in 2021 when, you know, contributions had begun, but benefits actually hadn't started. So we want to make sure that we, you know, have lessons that we learned um, as the program has, you know, matured. And we have to make sure the policy documents for private plans uh, don't get stale either. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, a little bit of a PowerPoint, just so you're not looking at me while I read to you. So, um, the sort of one of the things that we we had a couple of um, compliance, minor compliance issues with private the private plan policies that I think involves the the documents sort of long and not the most easy to digest and understand. Um, and I think we're going to try and find ways to make it easier to uh, get through, uh, easier for the, the public to understand and, and realize what their requirements are when you have a private plan in place. Uh, so that's sort of one pillar. And then the other pillar is, as I mentioned, sort of making sure the document, the uh, policies are up to date and accurate. So we're going to spend this month um, reviewing the document uh, and making revisions to it and then presenting it to the full board with the recommended changes. Uh, this PowerPoint is just basically trying to categorize what we expect to find as we do this review. Um, and then the next page has a couple of suggested policies that are sort of brand new policies we would like to implement around private plans. The, the first um, item is just truly the things that are out of date. As the committee may remember, when we had initially drafted the, the private plan policies, um, we sort of had an interim period where we had some framework of a plan, but we didn't have the full policy in force. Basically, anyone who's approved 
prior to November of 2021, had like a two-step process where they got conditional approval and then official approval later. We're all back, we're past that period. So we can, you know, remove that information from the policy document because it no longer is applicable. That should help both removing things that are no longer apply, but also make the document shorter and easier to understand. Um, another item that we have is the uh, audits, the private plan audits. We wrote some vague language about audits, um, some minor, an overview of what we would expect, but that was before we had adopted the official audit guide. So now we can adjust the details to make sure they're consistent or maybe just refer to the audit guide. Second category of kind of anticipated changes to the these is around the end of the three-year approval period. Back in 2021, three years seemed like so far into the future, and we sort of had an idea of what we expected, but there weren't a lot of details about what happens at the end of the three-year period. The next topic on the agenda for this meeting I'll also addresses a little bit more, but surprisingly, we're close to the end of that period right now. Um, the mm -hmm. first private plans that were approved were approved back in the first quarter of 2021, effective January 1st of 2021, which puts the end of the three-year period at basically end of this year. So we're about a little over six months away from that. So just having official, you know, what to expect when your plan gets to that period and what are the options available to employers when they get to that period, we really want to make sure that's spelled out in the policy. And this last category on this page is essentially the, what I talked about before, about making it more understandable. So it's the documents in 37 pages long when you include it, uh, the attachments. Is there a way for us to shorten that and maybe structure it to make it more understandable? Um, one option we were thinking is maybe having a section that's talking about the process and then a separate section that's talking about the rules or another possibility is um, kind of dividing into three sections. Here's everything about the application process in one section. Here's everything about once you're approved, how to administer it. And then a third section for when you're ready to, ready to wind down the plan or at the end of that three year period. So finding better ways to structure it to make sure it's, you know, as digestible as possible for the public. So we may find other things as sort of we review it, but that's sort of anticipated what, what we would we expect to see. The other sort of two specifics, um, you know, provisions that we we would like to uh, propose and we'd love the committee's feedback on were, were things we've lessons learned from the program as we've kind of gone through it these past couple of years. One is related to fees um, for refunds for approved private plans. Um, we're sort of calling this a restocking fee. Um, a larger than expected number of employers um, have been approved for a private plan, which means they no longer owe contributions to us, but then they continue to provide us with contributions. Um, we obviously refund those contributions back to the employer, who then would owe them back to their employees. Uh, this has been happening. Um, we expected maybe a few. Uh, this could happen on a couple of cases, but it's happening a little bit more than we thought. And happening for some employers, even after we refund one time, they continue to do it which is problematic for several reasons. Um, one is just our finance team has to spend time and effort and obviously their salaries on processing these approval or processing these refunds. Um, we'd much rather have them spend it on things that are, you know, about progressing the program forward. The second is it's sort of a red flag about what are they withholding from their employees? If they're giving us, mm -hmm. you know, half a percent of contributions, what, are they also taking another half a percent for their private plan and administering the private plan or paying an insurance company? So it sort of is a red flag on what's going on with their contributions and, and the employees' um, deductions. We can obviously address that via audits. We can look at those cases specifically and confirm that. But also this is another way of having an incentive for employers to pay attention to what they're withholding from employees. So at least our proposal at the moment, um, and we'll write language for it uh, that we'll share with the committee and the board uh, hopefully next month, is essentially say the first time this happens, we'll refund you the money. The second time this happens, we'll refund the employer the money. The third time it happens, we'll refund the, the money, but also add a charge to the, to the uh, refund that would be payable, obviously, by the employer, not out of the employee's contributions. That's essentially one more incentive to make sure that these um, this doesn't keep happening. Um, it wouldn't be a massive charge, but it would be something that would, would get their attention to say, you know, this needs to stop. So that's that's one proposed uh, policy we expect to have language for next month. The okay. other proposed policy um, that's sort of a lesson learned from our, uh, you know, administering the program so far is about a reason, specific reasons for denying an application for a private plan. Um, 
one thing we realized is we never officially said that if that you have to make sure you made all your past contributions before we'll approve a private plan, we feel like that's appropriate. Um, if you're requesting approval for a private plan and exemption from contributions, you should be up to date on the contributions to that point. Um, one sort of complication of that is the last contribution is owed as of the effective date of the private plan, but there's sort of a grace period. So it's possible that that last payment will become late after the approval has been made and after the plan is in effect, and that may involve rescinding the, the private plan approval. But we think that is appropriate because it is an, you know, an obligation that they owe prior to the plan going into effect. So that's one reason we could have for potentially denying an application for a private plan. The other um, possible reason is sort of a category of reasons. If there's anything, they, if they had a previous private plan and they did not follow through on, on their obligations to administer that plan according to the requirements of the program, that could also be reason to not approve the, the second or the renewal request for that private plan. You know, some examples are if they didn't keep coverage in force the first time, the private plan the second time, or similarly, if they didn't provide the annual report that we require. And these, the sort of the idea behind this is the request to have a private plan is includes an employer's confirmation that they're able to administer it. It's sort of an additional, you know, actions required on their part. And if if they're not able to handle that administration, we shouldn't be asking, we shouldn't be approving their plan. So sort of taking their history into account and their, you know, ability to administer it in the past, feel proven in the future. The first category, the one about you know, the contributions to the public program, that feels like more of a hard line. Um, if you, if you, if you're up, the way to get the approval in that case is to provide the contributions that are owed to us and then we'll, we'll approve your plan. The second is more of a, mm -hmm. if you can establish that you made mistakes in the past, but you fixed those errors and it won't happen again, maybe we do allow you to get approval. It wouldn't be as, as hard a bar, um, you know, but we would ask you, ask the employers to prove that they had changed and they had made necessary process improvements to ensure that they are following the requirements. So those are basically the two we sort of specific um, policies I wanted to identify for the committee. And obviously I'm open to their to your thoughts on that. Um, but we also would probably find other things as we do this review and we'll have sort of recommendations, um, you know, next month. So that's it for my presentation. Happy to take any questions um, or any comments. Any questions or comments for Michael on the uh, private plan policy revisions? I just have one observation, which is of all the things that have been anticipated over the creation of this program, I think employer employers over contributing was not on the list. Yeah. <laughs> and it's surprising to hear that there's multiple employers doing this repeatedly yeah yeah and we sort of expected mistakes here and there because obviously they're using tpas and sometimes the communication doesn't happen immediately but it's it's larger than we expected and more you know repetitive than we expected mm -hmm. we would love you know people donating to the program you know we can accept grants but employers shouldn't be taking their employees money and then giving to us without yeah. it's yeah. not how it should be working so um yeah, it, yeah to your point it wasn't expected but it is happening yeah. And I think okay. I, I just to add to that one of the reasons that it seems that we get repeat offenders is because um, there's no friction. You know, TPA takes the money out, the employer doesn't see it. We send it back, the employer's like, great. You know, the employer's like, oh, well, I mean, now we have to give it back to our employees. That's a pain. But the bigger issue is that they're taking money they shouldn't take. So we want to just add um, another layer of disincentive mm, so sure. that um, they actually take it seriously and make sure, and hold mm. their TPAs accountable if it is a TPA issue. Mm. Okay. Any further questions or comments on uh, private plan policy revisions? Hearing none, we will move to uh, Michael again for an update on private plan renewals and audits. Thank you, Mike. Um, so no presentation this time, just me talking. Um, I'll start with the audits, um, just a status on what we had, um, what we've accomplished so far. Uh, we had previously shared with the committee and the board that we had undertaken uh, three audits of private plans. 
Um, we're still in the middle of that process. Um, we've requested some documents, received them from two out of the the third, we just haven't officially requested it yet. So everyone's on schedule, um, no red flags, both um, from the perspective of, it looks like the plans are running appropriately from what we've seen so far. Obviously there's still review that's necessary, but then also the process seems to be working okay. You know, the, the meetings have, have run smoothly, the you know process to upload documents to us, the system we used seems to be working. So, so far so good on the audits. Mm -hmm. um, obviously fingers crossed, there's a lot of ground still to cover, but um, you know, looking good so far. As far as the renewals, and this is sort of what I, I had um, referred to in the prior conversation, we're at the end of the three-year period for a large number of approved private plans, um, or getting close to it. Uh, we have about a third of our total private plans were approved in the first quarter of 2021, and they're set to expire. So we wanted to make sure we gave them as much notice as possible um, about their obligations to, you know, make make a, a choice, either renew for another three years, come back to the public program. So we are sending out a notice. It's hopefully going out today to all the employers, um, essentially telling them the two options. If you would like to, you know, renew at the end of the year, you need to submit a new application, you know, with new documents provided to your employees and a new vote of your employees in favor of that plan. Mm -hmm and submit it to us um, prior to, hopefully prior to end of, uh, basically December 1st of the end of this year. And then we'll approve it uh, and you know get you going on the next three years. The other option is to come back to the public program. For that, we are asking for a little bit more notice. We asked for 90 days notice. Um, you know, so that's basically the beginning of October. The reason for that is we wanna make sure that AFLAC's ready to take on those new claims. So if an employee has a claim starting January 1st and they're ready to file in November, we want to make sure we don't deny that saying you're under a private plan. So by giving us notice you know, earlier, we can prepare AFLAC to, to intake those claims. So this is just going to be the first notice we send out. Uh, so it's the first communication we send out. We're going to contact them a couple more times to let them know. You know, we have a quarterly newsletter. So the third quarter newsletter will also share this information. And then maybe one more reach out uh, closer to the due dates. This is all sort of triggering in their mind that, by the way, you know, you had an exemption that's coming to a close, you know, start to, it's time to start thinking about what you want to do for next steps. And this is just the first quarter. So the, mm -hmm. the first batch of private plans This will sort of be a quarterly cycle where we'll continue to do this as the next batch comes up. As I mentioned, about a third of the private plans that are currently approved were from this quarter. So unfortunately, it's sort of the, the hardest quarter is the first. We don't get the opportunity to ramp up. Um, all the more reason why we're glad we're starting this early and sort of having six months to you know, get this done right. Um, we don't want to feel like any employer was put on notice at the last moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll find out if the notices all go. I imagine some people may get, you know, their contacts no longer valid. We'll have to find alternative ways to contact them. And maybe we use the insurance carriers or EPAs. Maybe we send, you know, physical mail. But all the more reason, uh, I said before that, uh, we're getting started early on this. Um, so any questions or concerns, um, please let me know. Hey, any um, questions, comments for Michael on plan renewals and audits? I just have a couple quick questions. Remind me how many private plans we have approximately? It's around 700. Um, so some of those may be plans that were approved and then they renewed early, sort of got a new application, but I, I think it, it's more than 650, less than yeah. 710. Um, I don't have the exact number, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood. Okay. But that's a big number in the first quarter when you- uh... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sort of the, the, the biggest- 300. Sorry. No, good. Um, and I think some of those 300 fortunately renewed early, so we kind of don't have to worry about them until later, but- uh, so I think it's 200 to 230 uh, that we're sent. We're really concerned about what we're doing. The most important part is probably us preparing, to have the time to review all the notices and applications you receive in the fall for this batch. Um, so we're basically going to have to block off our schedules for November to kind of accept, expect and see maybe possibly hundreds of applications mm -hmm. for new programs. Um, that's the sort of scary part on the and is that some who does that at the age at the authority so, so right now it's one person on my team kathy heilich um previously with aaron but then she gave that to kathy so she's doing that i imagine we're not going to expect mm -hmm. her to do all of that 
uh, in November. Um, so Joe's here in this meeting. He's on my team as well. Um, I'll help out. And then if we need to and Aaron's available, yeah. um, she may lend a hand in approve some applications as well. Okay. Uh, and then just jumping to the audits for a moment, uh, do you have any anticipated timeline for when you will complete the audits? Yes, yeah, they're sort of um, they're staggered. I think when we're going to get to the end, we have our application audit, which is probably the furthest along. Um, maybe come to an end next month. Um, we probably have the documents we need. I think we may make one request out for more information on this, which is sort of three week timeline because we issue a draft report. They get to respond to it for a final report. So I think that will that will be done. Um, the claims audit might be the longest because we haven't yet requested the full claim files. So sort of the step we're at there is we've gotten some documentation and, and a list of their claims. And then later this week, we're going to ask for specific claims that we'll then review. So that one probably will be August, maybe September timeframe. And then the contribution is probably somewhere in the middle of there. And we'll... We, we we deliberately went slow for this this first tranche so that we could test the process and kind of get everybody up to speed. Um, but the plan is to get into a regular cadence of having different audits at different stages so that there's not these sort of long. Going mm -hmm. forward, we don't have to have everything complete before we start a brand new um, cohort of audits. So we'll just keep moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments or questions about plan renewals and audits? Okay, we'll move to the next uh, item. Aaron, can you give us um, an update on the authority staffing? Absolutely. We realized it's been a while since we shared our org chart, um, and Amber mm. uh, put together a very detailed chart that I'm going to share with you right now. And then we will also to the board, um, you can see, mm -hmm. but, you know, gone are the days where we could all fit in one page with pictures and giant font. Uh, we have 35 employees with one posted vacancy. And as you can see, we're we're pretty stuffed up uh, in terms of the claims administration, legal, finance, outreach and engagement, government relations, and IT with administrative staff. So this page really shows all of our positions with, with the names of the individuals who are working. Um, I'll just show you the next page. Sorry, let me get to... Um, Try to make it a little bit bigger. So a little bit bigger, um, still pretty, pretty full. We have um, sort of the executive team, and then you know our ben our benefits team consists of John Priscilla as the vendor performance manager and the four uh, benefits and business support specialists who are spending a good deal of their time right now auditing claim files, so auditing AFLAC's work, uh, but they continue to serve as benefits and business support specialists, so assisting with escalations for workers who need assistance, helping with businesses, um, sometimes being the, the go-between um, so have situations where employers don't understand their obligations to complete the employment verification form and, and this team can assist with that. The finance team is really kind of in two parts. We've got you know, the authorities' finances um, as well as the contributions. So the contributions team is the one that we've been beefing up um, because of the fund recovery efforts and the ongoing efforts to make sure that we're getting all of the funds appropriate. IT continues to be um, something that we're working to make sure that our staff is um, able to do the ongoing work of the team and so that we're not always looking at for outside vendors for um, our IT projects. For our significantly large IT projects like the website replatforming, that's an outside vendor. 
Um, but we have a lot of work that needs to be done to you know, build and develop and maintain our IT programs. Um, we do use Salesforce as our primary platform. And that is a, a skill set that is much in demand, but we've been really um, we've been really fortunate to recruit some really great people. So just wanted to again let you see kind of where we are. We've grown. You know, go. Two years ago, I think there were 10 of us. So um, we've tripled in size. We don't anticipate growing at that rate any longer. Um, there are, as I said, one post vacancy right now that's on this on the um, org chart. There are a couple other positions that we're talking about internally as do we need it? What does it look like um, that we may be looking to fill in the next fiscal year? But we continue to be really thoughtful and conscious of what are our ongoing needs? Is this a, a long-term need or is this a temporary situation? I just mm -hmm. wanted to share that and see if you had any questions. Any questions or comments for Aaron on the uh, authority staffing? In next year's budget, Aaron, how many positions, additional positions are budgeted? That's a great question that I should have been prepared for, that I'm not, I think, um, I think it was like six yeah. um, that we put into the budget and knowing that they were gonna be sort of staggered. Um, mm -hmm. So there weren't, we didn't fund it for everybody starting on July 1st. Yeah. But, um, you know, we've kind of tried to think about what we'll need and make sure that we have mm -hmm. have the money for it. And then, um, you know, there's a couple of IT positions. There's I think one more finance position. There's, uh, we're talking about a paralegal possibly in legal if we need that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still a question of, do we fill the COO position as a COO? Do we turn that into like a project management position? So those are the mm -hmm. staffing thoughts we need for next year. Okay, thank you. Any further questions or comments on authority staffing? Now let us move to um, a legislative update. Madeline, would you please uh, provide that update? Um, yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, just going to share my screen. You, you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Practice beforehand. Um, so yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm just going to provide a quick update on our legislative work. Um, as everyone knows, the 2023 legislative session ends tomorrow, um, June 7th. So things are really wrapping up. Um, over the last few months, we've discussed here in some other board meetings, um, Senate Bill 1179, an act amending Connecticut paid family medical leave, um, which is legislation that we support. As a reminder, the bill um, provides a clear definition of municipality and Connecticut paid leave and FMLA. It creates a procedure for tribes to participate in Connecticut paid leave, um, and it clarifies the interaction between employer provided benefits like short term disability and Connecticut paid leave. Um, so Senate Bill 1179 passed the Senate on May 24th with an amendment, which we also supported. Um, the amendment made two key changes. Um, first, uh, the original bill allowed tribal enterprises or governments um, to opt into Connecticut paid leave through a procedure similar to how um, we work with sole proprietors. The amended bill that passed the Senate represents conversations that we had with um, the Mashantucket tribe, and instead it enables the state to enter into an MOU with tribes to allow them par to participate um, in Connecticut paid leave. This language um, respects tribal sovereignty. And, and again, it represents conversations that we had with key stakeholders to uh, make sure that um, they were on board with, with this language. Um, second, the amendment clarifies, um, well, it makes a change to section three of the bill and it clarifies that employer provided benefits may offset or coordinate with Connecticut paid leave only to the extent that compensation is actually paid. 
Um, the amendment states that unless mandated by state or federal law, no employee should be required to apply to Connecticut paid leave, um, which essentially allows employer employees with access to both like employer provided benefits like short term disability and Connecticut paid leave to choose which program they use and when. Um, this section is the amended bill is different than the original language, which stated that um, insurance policies and employer sponsored plans um, can reduce benefits. They provide only to the extent necessary that the employee um, does not receive more than 100% of their regular wages. Um, the amendment also pushes the effective date of the bill to July 1, um, 2024. Um, and again, this passed the Senate uh, at the end of May. Um, it hasn't received action in the in the House as of today. Um, okay. okay, then just lastly, over the past few months, we've also mentioned Senate Bill 1223, an act concerning the State Contracting Standards Board. Um, Aaron testified in opposition to this bill in March. Um, it expands the power and authority of the State Contracting Standards Board and gives them pre-approval authority over any proposed contracts that it deems to be privatization. Um, this passed the GAE committee um, in March, but it's still waiting action in, in the Senate, so it hasn't moved forward. Um, and that's, yeah, that's all I have. So. Any questions or comments from Madeline? Well, thank you, Madeline. I have a question for you. So what do you think the chances are that either of these will pass by tomorrow? Um, not not high, but yeah. I mean, we're, yeah, we'll still like continue to work. I think on Senate Bill eleven seventy nine, like the concepts that are in there, you know, out of session, and and hopefully try again next year because it's 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 important what's in the bill. So, well, I read your the authority summary of the twelve twenty three, and that was very troubling. So I'm glad to see that's not progressed. Yeah. <laughs> There's, you can never say never. Um, mm -hmm. 1179 has been through the Senate, so it only has to go through the House. The House has been up till now incredibly focused on uh, the budget. So, you know, if it's going to go, it's going to go today or tomorrow. Um, 1223 would have to go through both chambers, and that's mm -hmm. not impossible. It's been yeah. done. I've done it. Um, we're hoping it won't happen this time. <laughs> but, right. um, the other quasi public agencies have expressed concerns about 1223 and at least one of the provisions in 1223 affected um, all state agencies and it related to um, uh, personal services agreements and alternate language about how to handle personal services agreements was included in the budget. So my hope and assumption is that that because they acted on that element of it in the budget bill, yeah. that the proponents are satisfied with that and therefore that'll sort of carry the day and they won't need to bring out 1223. Okay, thank you. Any further questions or comments concerning um, the legislative update? So let's move to uh, old business. Is there any old business anyone would like to discuss? Hearing none, is there any new business anyone would like to discuss? Also hearing nothing, uh, in that case, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll make a motion to adjourn, Eva. Thank you, Eva. Can I have a second, please? Second. <laughs> okay, all in favor of adjourning the meeting? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the meeting is adjourned. It is 10.01. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody.